Good morning, everybody. Good morning. A warm welcome to you to St George's today and to those who are watching online, either live or later. It's good to have you joining with us in worship from wherever you are. I have a number of messages, notices that I need to uh, give out, and so I just beg for your patience at this time. Um, first of all, the clear up morning next Saturday is at 8.30, and I'm afraid <laughs> I made a mistake last week and said, oh yeah, just sign up, there's a breakfast. Actually, I'm getting my, my uh, clean up days uh, slightly confused, because that happens in the, when we do all the, the churchyards and stuff. So I'm afraid there won't be a breakfast, so you don't have to sign up. I know, well, you can bring something. Um, <laughs> but if you can, if you are able to, to offer just, you know, half an hour, an hour, just to so we can clear this church, make it as beautiful as we possibly can to get into Holy Week and Easter, it would be greatly appreciated. So do come along next Saturday at 8.30, and let's make this place beautiful. Ne uh, tomorrow we have our Lent course, our final session. I hope people have enjoyed it and have learned a lot from it. We've got our online course on the, tomorrow evening, 8 o'clock, and then our in-person session on Tuesday at 2. So do come along and uh, enjoy that. And if you want to give me some feedback about how you feel it's gone, that would be great. Um, please do share your thoughts. So we head into Holy Week next week. So we have our Palm Sunday service next week. We've got a cameo party on Monday. The school service is here on Tuesday morning. On Wednesday, we have Eve Walker's Thanksgiving service here at two o'clock. So if you'd like to come and celebrate Eve's life uh, and support the Walker family, then please do come at two o'clock on Wednesday next Wednesday, not this Wednesday. Um, thank you, yes. Uh, on Thursday evening at eight o'clock, we have the Maundy Thursday service with washing of feet and the stripping of the altars. Good Friday, we have our two o'clock meditation at the foot of the cross. And then two weeks today, it is Easter, and we will have our Easter celebration at 10.30. So a little bit of a canter through what is happening. Do put it in your diary. Do come along. All are invited to come and follow, um, follow this uh, walk towards the cross, but then through the cross to the empty tomb. So after Easter, we are heading into APCM territory and there are some electoral rolls forms at the back. So if you want to come and join um, the electoral roll here, say this is the place that's home for me, then, and you haven't done so, please do um, sort that out, write it at the back, and we will be more than happy to um, invite you in, because actually you have to be on the electoral roll if you come to the APCM and want to speak or vote on anything. So that would be helpful. It's also a chance to consider the governance of this church and our place in it. So Sarah Griffiths is not very well today, so we do pray, Sarah, that you're feeling better soon. But we also want to give uh, congratulations to you and Trevor for being grandparents again, because uh, Archie James has been born to Emma and Rich, so congratulations to them. But the thing is that Sarah will be stepping down after five years of service as a church warden. Now Sarah will say, uh, and I suspect she'd probably prefer for me to say it than for her to do it, but she has said to me how much she has enjoyed being church warden. It's not something that she would have chosen for herself. It's not one she would have thought a role that suited her, but she'd really enjoyed it, she's learnt a lot, and she's got a lot out of it. And it came, her standing came as a result of a prompt from God. And we have been so grateful, Sarah, for all of your support, for all that you, you have given in these five years of service. But it does mean that we have a vacancy coming up, and we also have Elizabeth will be stepping down as our parish safeguarding officer, 
and there will be people coming off the PCC as well. It would be disappointing if a community such as this could not have a full complement of church officers. Now I say this because we are heading towards an important crossroads. You need to know that it's really significant that we have a full complement with our involvement with LIE. Now we can't actually use the words officially pastoral reorganisation because that's a legal term and they have to go through a, a kind of consultation process in both communities. But it looks likely that we will be heading that way. And at the moment, Lai, which is, has a smaller congregation, has two church wardens, and I'm asking for your help. I'm asking for you to consider whether this is something you can do, because it's going to be a challenging time bringing two worshipping communities together. And we will all need support, especially me. And so, I, you know, I hate doing this, but I'm asking you to really consider whether, and those online as well, to ask what following Christ looks like in this church. Now, I know people do a lot, and I am so grateful for your service. Um, but I'm asking everyone to reconsider whether perhaps even if they thought, no, I'm not sure it's for me, or I don't want to do it, or I'm not sure I've got the time, or whatever, to think about the governance of this church. Now, please do talk to Lisa or I um, after the service or in the next couple of weeks. But most importantly, ask God, is this something that I should be doing? Tell me, and if it doesn't, if it's not, that's fine. We don't want to, you know, twist your arm, push you into the corner. But at the same time, I can tell you that this is going to be a bit bumpy in places, because it will be if you bring communities together and manage service structures, and suddenly there's going to be an awful lot more work for, uh, for me and uh, for Hannah as well to be involved in. And we need some kind of backup if we're not going to kind of decay here. We want to continue being the strong, vibrant community that we are. So thank you for considering this. And I ask you just to be open to the leading of the Holy Spirit, as Sarah was, and really has really enjoyed it. And ask that you just respond if God says, actually, yes, it is time to step up. So thank you for your time, for your commitment, and for your love of this church. Amen. Please stand while we sing our first hymn, There is a Wideness in God's Mercy.
grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Please sit or kneel for our confession. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. We say together, Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done wrong in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Mighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We say thee collect for the fifth Sunday of Lent. Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world, grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Michael will now bring us our first reading. <coughs> the Old Testament reading is taken from Jeremiah chapter 31, reading verses 31 to 34. This is on page 794 in the Pew Bibles. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers, when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbour or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Thanks be to God. Please stand and sing our second song, How Deep the Father's Love.
remain standing for the gospel. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus predicts his death. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honour the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you O Lord. Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, open our hearts and our minds to your message about service to you from the Gospel reading this morning. In your name we ask it. Amen. A ragged boy with a violin under his arm once roamed the streets of Europe. A famous musician hearing him play and learning that the boy had no home nor family took him under his wing. He became like a father to the boy and taught him all he knew about the violin. The boy practiced faithfully and then came the night of his first performance. He played so well that after each number the applause was deafening but for some reason, the boy didn't pay any attention to the huge ovation. He kept his eyes turned upwards and played on and on. The audience was mystified by this behaviour. And finally, someone said, I don't understand why he is so insensitive to this thunderous applause. He keeps looking up all the time. I'm going to find out what is attracting his attention. 
Moving around the concert hall, the man found the answer. There, in the uppermost balcony, was the old music master. Looking over the railing towards his young pupil and nodding his head as if to say, well done, my boy, play on. The boy played on, seemingly unconcerned whether the audience liked it or not. He was playing to please his master only. So this is a question for us too, especially this morning. Are we pleasing our master Jesus today? Are we looking up at him? Is he nodding his head in approval to our lives? In that gospel reading, Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, where in just a few days' time, he would be crucified and would die for the sins of the world. Some Greeks were on their way to worship at the festival when they meet Philip, one of Jesus' disciples. And these Greeks made a request of Philip. They wanted to see Jesus. What happened after they spoke to Philip may have been something that they weren't expecting. The festival John mentions was, of course, Passover, held during Nisan, the first month of the Jewish calendar, or mid-March to mid-April in our calendars. Passover was one of the three festivals each year where every Jewish male was required to come to Jerusalem. And so Jesus and the disciples would have been heading there to observe this festival. So the Jews of Israel would attend the festival, but other Jews would have been coming too. After the kingdom of Judah fell to Babylon in about 588 BC, a number of Jews did return to Judah, but many stayed on in Babylon, Persia, and parts of what we now know of as the Middle East. You might remember the story of Pentecost and that long, long list of places that people had come from to that festival. So besides these Jews of the dispersion, as they were known, or other lands apart from Judea and Galilee, there were also some Gentiles who were converts to Judaism. Some of them had been circumcised and fully accepted into the Jewish faith. Their exact number may never be known, but one of them was Nicholas of Antioch, who was one of the original seven men chosen to look after the Greek widows in Acts 6. And there were others who weren't circumcised, but renounced pagan worship and followed the law of Moses. All of these men were welcome to take part in the Passover in Jerusalem. So the text mentions some Greeks, but whether they were Jews who spoke Greek and lived outside the borders of Israel or Gentile converts, we don't know exactly who they were. But what is certain is that these men were on their way to worship at the festival. But there was something they wanted to see, and that was to see Jesus himself. The Bible's original language has several different words for to see, ranging in meaning from simply to look at something to actually experiencing something. And it's that latter word that these Greeks use here when they asked Philip the question. But I wonder why they came to Philip specifically. One theory is that he had a Greek name, the same as Andrew, so maybe they felt more at ease with someone whose name was similar to their own. Or maybe Philip was just the first disciple that they met on their journey. It was as simple as that. After they made the request, we're told that Philip decided to find Andrew and explain the situation to him. Why Philip didn't go to Jesus by himself is never specified. But presumably, Philip chose to involve Andrew because he had limited experience, maybe, of introducing people to Jesus himself. The only time we read about it in the Bible is in John 1 with Nathaniel. And of course, he might have known that Andrew was pretty good at this. 
Andrew had introduced his own brother Simon to Jesus. He had made friends with a small boy who ended up giving his lunch to Jesus, which was then used to feed 5,000 people. After the request had been made, Jesus then gives a fourfold reply to Peter and Andrew. There's no indication again that he actually spoke to the Greeks himself. The first thing Jesus said was, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. He uses this word hour several times in the Gospels, with the first time being in John 2 at the wedding in Cana, where his mother came to Jesus and said, they don't have any more wine, which as we know would have been a real embarrassment in those days. And Jesus simply replied then, my hour has not yet come, most likely meaning it wasn't the time to perform a miracle. Of course, he did turn water into wine, literally saving the day and allowing the wedding feast to continue. Another time Jesus used the word hour was when he spoke with a Samaritan woman in John 4. Jesus was sitting by the well, thirsty and tired, and it was the sixth hour, we're told, or noon. And when she came to the well, he asked her for a drink. As the conversation developed, Jesus commented that the hour was coming when it didn't matter where people worship the Father. And in fact, he said, it has now come, meaning people can worship God anywhere, not just in the temple in Jerusalem. And we read on two occasions in John 7 and John 8 that the Jewish authorities are unable to touch Jesus because his hour had not yet come then it wasn't time for him to suffer death. Not before he had made it to Calvary so that he could die for our sins and be resurrected for our salvation. Jesus' second reply uses the words very truly in the New International Version or in the older version, the King James Version, it says verily, verily. This is another phrase that's often used in John's Gospel. Here it is about how a grain of wheat produces nothing unless it is sown into the ground and dies in order to produce new grain or new life. This figure of speech would have been familiar to the disciples who would have remembered the parable of the sower and how where the seed fell produced different results. Or maybe Jesus was giving an indication that he was going to die and that he himself would be the first fruits. Jesus had told the disciples several times that he was on his way to Jerusalem to die, but also to rise again, and they still weren't quite getting it. Some years later, Paul mentions this concept in 1 Corinthians 15, when he writes about our resurrection bodies. This idea of sowing the seed so that it would die, but produce fruit as a consequence, would have been very familiar to the people of that period, Jews or Gentiles. Thirdly, Jesus provides another paradox. Anyone who loves their life will lose it while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. He and the disciples may have been thinking about the rich young ruler mentioned in the three other Gospels who came to Jesus and asked him what he had to do to inherit eternal life. But when he heard Jesus reply, walked away in sadness. But Jesus might have simply been giving a bit of encouragement because the disciples had left everything behind to follow Jesus and their journey was very difficult. They were struggling with their earthly lives, but he said they would keep them forever, whereas many others loved their lives but would lose everything. These Greeks had come to worship at the festival but how much they endured being followers of a foreign religion, living in a foreign country, 
is quite hard to imagine. And finally, Jesus gives a challenge. Whoever serves me must follow me. Many, many people had followed Jesus up to this point, but it seems that only a few were openly following him now as he approached the end of his life on earth. He had only a few days, maybe a few hours, before he was crucified and he knew he would rise again. And so he gave the Greeks and anyone else listening a promise. Where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honour the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, Jesus confesses towards the end of the reading. Jesus, of course, understood the meaning of this sign, a word that John uses frequently in his gospel. He knew what the coming of the Greek visitors represented. He was very aware of what he must now do and what he must now face. But he doesn't argue with his father. He doesn't bargain with God. He understands that his mission must be fulfilled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this very reason I have come to this hour, says Jesus. Father, glorify your name. Jesus had come to this world for a reason, for a purpose, and that purpose had to be completed. The fulfilment of that mission was to be the ultimate defeat of darkness. And that defeat would then become the greatest sign of hope for the world. Out of the darkest moment in the world's history, the crucifixion of God's Son would shine the light of salvation and of eternal life. So just after our reading, Jesus says to the disciples, walk while you have the light before the darkness overtakes you. Today, over 2,000 years later, he is speaking those same words of hope and encouragement to you and to me. With the world in constant turmoil as it is due to war and natural disasters, economic downturns, and suffering of all kinds, it sometimes feels that light and darkness are still battling it out, doesn't it? But as with the disciples in our passage, Jesus is calling us to make a choice. We can either walk in the darkness, or we can listen to and take notice of the words of Jesus and use them to shine a light of hope and truth into any despair that we come across. Since that moment in history, countless numbers of people from all over the world have followed Jesus, which is amazing. But there is still a need for people to follow him, even today. The rewards may not be much on this earth, but in heaven, one day, we have the promise that the Father will honour those who truly follow Jesus. So will one of those be you? Amen.
If you are willing and able, please stand as we declare our faith in God. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please sit or kneel as Sarah brings us our prayers. In the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you have written the law of love in the hearts of all people. Help us to receive you now in faith as you come to meet each one of us where we are. May your church worldwide be a place of encounter where love and grace heal the divisions we have created. Strengthen in the service of Christ, Jonathan and Simon, our bishops, Mandy, our vicar, Hannah, our curate, and all the ministry team. May those who confess your name be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Bless and guide Charles our King and all the royal family. Give healing and restoration to full health for the King and for Catherine, Princess of Wales. We pray for their protection and for wise judgment from all who advise them. At a time of heightened political tension around the world, we pray for peace, especially between Israel and Palestine, Russia and Ukraine, and the warring factions in Sudan. We pray for all the internally displaced people and those who are refugees and we remember all who are held hostage. I will read two verses of Fred Kahn's hymn, Put Peace into Each Other's Hands. Between the verses, let us offer a moment of collective silent prayer for peace around the world and for what it means to live peaceably with one another. Put peace into each other's hands and like a treasure hold it. Protect it like a candle flame. With tenderness enfold it. Put peace into each other's hands with loving expectation. Be gentle in your words and ways, in touch with God's creation. Give wisdom, Lord, to all in authority. Direct this and every nation in the ways of justice and peace that we may honour one another 
and seek the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. Give grace to us, our families and friends, and all our neighbours. Heavenly Father, you come to us in times of blessings and of failure. Help us to recognise our weaknesses and trust in your unfailing love for us and all people. We give thanks for the life of this village and for the many acts of thoughtfulness and kindness that we experience each day. May we serve Christ in one another and seek the common good. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Comfort and heal all those in body, mind or spirit. We bring to you, Lord, all who are unwell, those waiting for treatment or test results, those who are fearful for the future, and those troubled by mental anguish and disturbed thoughts. We pray for those who have fallen into addiction and those who are homeless. We remember those who are grieving, especially the Whitbourne family James Whitbourne died last week. We pray especially for Alison, for Hannah, Naomi, and Simeon, for Catherine, James's sister, and for Philip and Anne, his parents, and for all their family and friends. Loving, fam loving Father, Give all who are suffering courage, healing, and hope in their troubles, and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear us as we remember those who have died in the faith of Christ, for James and for any others known to us at this time. We give thanks for all who have entered into your greater glory. May we, may we be inspired by their lives, and may we seek to live in the knowledge that your love is written in the hearts of all people. According to your promises, Lord, grant us with them a share in your eternal kingdom. Amen. And to end our intercessions, we'll read the last verse of Fred Kahn's hymn. Put Christ into each other's hands. He is love's deepest measure. In love, make peace. Give peace a chance. And share it like a treasure. Merciful Father, accept these prayers. For the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand. God is love and those who live in love live in God and God lives in them. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let's offer one another a sign of peace.
The Lord is here. The Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right and good to give you thanks and praise. Almighty God and everlasting Father, through Jesus Christ your Son. For in these forty days you lead us into the desert of repentance, that through a pilgrimage of prayer and discipline we may grow in grace and learn to be your people once again. Through fasting, prayer and acts of service, you bring us back to your generous heart. Through study of your holy word, you open our eyes to your presence in the world and free our hands to welcome others into the radiant splendour of your love. As we prepare to celebrate the Easter feast with joyful hearts and minds, we bless you for your mercy and join with saints and angels forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We praise and bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And as we obey his command, send your Holy Spirit that broken bread and wine outpoured may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread and gave it to them and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. Again he praised you, gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. So, Father, we remember all that Jesus did. In him we plead with confidence, his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross, bringing before you the bread of life and cup of salvation. We proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Lord of life, help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people. Gather us in your loving arms and bring us with St George and all the saints to feast at your table in heaven through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honour and glory are yours, O loving Father, for ever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father Amen. in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. 
Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, Redeemer of the world, grant us. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Thank you. 
just invite you before the prayer after communion to just lean into God's peace for each of us. Receive his comfort. Receive his strength. Receive his reassurance. Receive his love. Wherever we are, whatever we're carrying, May we know Jesus walking alongside us. And may we know his deep abiding presence and love. say the prayer after communion together. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you as souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your grace and stand and sing our final hymn, just waiting for the organist to get in place. Oh Jesus, I have promised. Please stand to sing.
Christ to give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, take up your cross, and follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. To a troubled world, peace, peace from, from Christ. Christ. To a searching world, love, love from, from Christ. Christ. To a waiting world, hope, hope from Christ. Christ.